Shalom and welcome everyone to today's program. Once again, I'm so pleased to have Dr. Brooke Corman joining us all the way from Israel. Welcome, Brooke. Hi, Christian. Good to see you again. How's are any changes in Israel or still pretty much the same from our last discussion? No, they have uh, lessened a little bit the restrictions. Now we can go anywhere we want in Israel. We can visit family and friends, uh, small groups, but still all the stores are supposed to be closed. Many open up regardless. The airport is still closed. I believe it's due to open up very, very shortly, hopefully. And uh, one thing interesting is that initially a lot of people want to get the vaccine. Today in Israel, anyone can get the vaccine who wants it, but the response has really tapered off. And they showed last night on the news that all of these places that they have very well organized, many people staffing them, go in, no wait, but no one is hardly coming. Very, very small numbers now are, are going to be, to be vaccinated. Some of the uh, foremost rabbis have come out against uh, being vaccinated for a variety of reasons. This is really going to impact the religious community, the, the Orthodox Jewish religious community, and not getting the vaccine. So interesting things going on. Absolutely. And that's probably a discussion that we can spend quite a bit of time on, on another discussion, I guess. But it, you're right. It's very interesting. But, uh, firstly, folks, I'd just like to thank everyone, first of all, for their response Uh in regards to our last discussion with Baruch about the warning against deception, I personally haven't had the opportunity to thank everyone. Uh, we had an overwhelming response, not only in terms of the number of views, but also so many positive comments and emails that we received. Um, and it highlighted that it is such an interesting and much needed topic to be discussed these days. So I personally would like to thank you very much and we welcome any future comments uh, in regards to any other themes that we'll be having in the near future. So once again, we thank you and we praise God for that response. Um, today's theme is equally as important as the last theme that we touched on in regards to warning against deception, which is Yeshua is the only way. Um, it's, it's a very debated topic worldwide these days, sadly, but Unfortunately, it is what it is. It is very, very much debated these days, which is a tragedy. Um, there is a very strong correlation, I believe, between our last program, Warning Against Deception, and the one that we'll be discussing today, uh, especially with the rise of the deceptive interfaith or progressive churches. Uh, we're going to look at uh, later on, once again, just like we did in the last program, uh, a short clip demonstrating some of what's going on around the world. Some uh, recent um, uh, clips, some are a little bit older, but it shows you how it's actually uh, gaining momentum, which is, from my point of view, straight from the pit of hell, anything that's interfaith or this progressive uh, so-called church movement. Um, I, I think that the purpose of this is to look at scriptural references uh, that you'll be uh, exploring and elaborating later on, Baruch, in regards to the exclusivity of Yeshua and how important that is, of course. But I think there's also, I just want to set the tone a little bit, there's there's a three topics within this one that we'd like to explore today because uh, people sadly also say, but, you know, where does it really tell you in the Bible that there's only one God? Obviously, they don't read their Bibles. Um, and some of them will even question, well, is God's word really true? How can you rely on it? I mean, those two things alone, I touched a little bit earlier with you, Baruch, that we could spend a couple of weeks looking at scriptural evidence for that there is only one God and the truth and the eternal um, you know, power of God's word. Uh, so we're going to focus more on Yeshua is the only way. But I just thought we'd, we'd touch on that a little bit as well to give us a little bit of um, an overview uh, to then lead us onto this discussion. So if you're ready, Baruch, let's begin. Let's begin. Uh, God's word, I think, is, is the most important thing that we have before us these days. Uh, the Bible, it is without any error whatsoever. It is the perfect book. We understand that some translations, uh, which you can probably elaborate a little bit further on, Baruch, there are some mistranslations, but 
the actual God's word is perfect as it is. And I just wanted to touch on two scriptures just to start with, because it has been Satan's plan from the beginning to put doubt uh, into people all over the world that God's word is the truth. Um, so we're going to touch a little bit on that. And I just want to look at Isaiah 40, verse 8, where it says that the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Just thought if you could just touch on that a little bit, Baruch, about the, uh, how the word of God will remain with us forever. I think in this verse, we see a contrast between the natural, the grass and the flower. Those things are of creation, but the word of God is unique. And the point here where it says it endures forever, obviously it's true, but this concept of forever in the Hebrew, eternity is always related to the kingdom. So if we're going to have a kingdom promise, a kingdom expectation, then we need to realize that it's the word of God that reveals to us everything that we need to know in order to move away from what is an eternal, this world that is fading. You just have to look in the mirror and look at old pictures of yourself to know that, that the body that we're in, it's dying out, it's aging, it's withering, it's, it's going to come to an end. But through the word of God and the revelation of God, which, as you said, absolutely truth, no air whatsoever. Therefore, we can be assured that its revelation gives to us the message of eternal life. And there's such a, a difference between that which is of the natural and that which belongs to God in a covenantal relationship with him. Correct. Thank you. And I think it's also important to note that from the beginning, Satan was very active in trying to discredit God's word, put doubts into people's hearts. When we look at Genesis 3.1, it basically tells us that now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He, meaning Satan, said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat any tree of any tree in the garden? I mean, here we see right from the beginning that it was his plan to place doubt in people's hearts and minds about the truth of God's word. And what we see in this, this, this chapter is when one doubts the authority, the truth of God's word, it leads to sin. And sin is connected to death throughout the Bible. We see that, that tight relationship between sin and death. So when we doubt the authority, the truth, the accuracy of God's word, it's going to move us away from that which is pleasing to God, that which reflects the character of God, that's which connected to the attributes of God. And it's going to bring us into sin and ultimately exactly what Satan's will is, and that is death. Where God's will is that we might have life, but it's the truth that sets us free from, from the bondage of this world, the bondage of sin, in order to receive freely the gift of eternal life. So God's word is foundational. And as you pointed out, I think this is very important that when we say the scriptures without error, we're talking about that original text that, for example, Paul wrote down, Moses wrote down, the prophets wrote down. Obviously, over the years, when man copied and copied, we see that there can be human error or when we go into translation. But what's so, so amazing is when we look at all the manuscripts and compare them side by side, we find that the, the differences, the, the problems that come from man, our errors, human mistakes, are so minuscule. And, and oftentimes we can see that, oh, there's a tradition because in Hebrew, there's two letters, just like in English, we have the C and the K, sometimes sounding identical, or a C and an S. Well, in Hebrew as well, there's letters that sound the same. And, and oftentimes you can see, they wrote this word down, spelling it with, with a psalmic instead of a sin. And it has a different meaning, but we can see through that, one fits the context, one doesn't. So the word of God is extraordinary accurate, even with the translations and the various manuscripts, 
the the discrepancies are very very small and usually can be discerned thank you we will now commence sharing our screen to start looking at some scriptures so i'll just uh, do this very quickly okay so as we said previously we, we we're going to touch on two or three scriptures that specifically are very very clear in the Bible, that there is only one God. I just want to start with Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verse 35. To you it was shown that you may know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. Over to you, bro. Yeah, here we see very clearly that there's one God. There is no other gods. Now, the Bible speak about Elohim Acharim other gods but what that phrase speaks to is not the existence of other gods and that we need to worship the god of israel and stay away from those gods it's clearly and we see this throughout the bible references that support this when the scripture says elohim acharim other gods it's a reference to that which is attributed to be god's idols in other words so there is only one God. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the redeemer. And whenever we go to the concept of another God through another religion, one of the big deceptions today is that Allah, the God of Islam, and, and the God of Israel, Elohim, are the one same God. This is false. When we look at what the Quran says about the attributes of Allah and compare that to what the scripture says concerning the attributes, the character of God, there's absolutely no consistency. There is a big difference between what the Quran says God is and what the scripture says God is in the same way, what the Quran says about Yeshua and what the New Testament says about Yeshua, very, very different. Muslims do not worship Yeshua. Muslims do not have in their mind that Allah and Elohim are the same gods and Christians ought not either. And thank you for pointing that out. And we're going to show a, a clip later on about that, that sadly that is still being taught in some churches, uh, which it just, it, it just, it's, it's mind staggering how that could happen. But, and you're right. And the most important thing, of course, that, um, you know, the God of Islam, Allah, he has no son. And it, and it purely negates the most important thing, which is that redemptive sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross as his only begotten son. And, um, you know, that he is the only way to the Father. So I totally agree with you. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit uh, later on today. So thank you. The next scripture we, I just want to look at. And of course, folks, there are so many scriptures that highlight that there is only one God. The true God of that, but we we are a little bit restricted to time. So I appreciate that some people would like to see a, bit, a few more scriptures, but we'll do what we can on today's program. So the next scripture I want to look at is First Kings chapter eight, verse sixteen. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God; there is no other. Let me say both of the, the last two verses that we, we've looked at, this one and the previous one, there's a, a false teaching that is associated with these verses when it says that there is no other, or we could translate it, there is nothing other. And this brings us to a wrong theology that everything in the world adds up to God. Mm -hmm. And I know that Hasidic Judaism speaks about the, the divinity. They speak about the nitzots, the the remnant or the, the sparks, so to speak, of God being located in all things and everything's divine and everything together makes up God. This is a heresy as well. It's amazing to me that, that those who, who know the Hebrew language would think that because the name, that sacred name of God with four letters, yud he vav -Hey, oftentimes in English they will speak about Jehovah God, Mm -hmm. This name means the God who transcends all things, the God who was, the God who is, and the God will, who will be. So he transcends time. So he's not connected. He created 
nature. He created this world, but he's also above it. He's not part of, and what is statement of heresy when we say he's part of creation, he is not part of creation. But going back to the simple understanding of this verse, here's a great text that says there's only one God. And if we look at the context, we see that, again, in this section of scripture, it's warning the, the people, the covenant people, in, in regard to idolatry, that there's other things that are worship. That's true. There are other things that are worship, but they ought not be worship because they do not at all reflect the biblical condition, the biblical constraints for being God. Those constraints lead us to a conclusion, as this scripture says, only one God. And let me just simply say, because we'll get a question about this, and it's a, it would be a great question. One God in no way hinders the, the theological truth concerning the Trinity, yes. that God has revealed himself in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Although I strongly believe in the Trinity, the divinity of, of the Son, the divinity of the Spirit, but these three persons don't add up to God. Each one individually is God, but we don't have three gods. We have one God. So that's a very important truth that we need to, to always maintain. Amen. Thank you for uh, sharing that as well. There's no doubt that would be a question. The last scripture I want to look at is uh, a very powerful scripture in Isaiah, uh, chapter 46, verse 9, which I'm, I'm sure most people are familiar with. But remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Here again, the uniqueness. Other things are worshipped, unfortunately. Other things and ones are proclaimed to be God. For example, we go to Egypt, Pharaoh. And we look at other places in the world where individuals take on a, a status of divinity or divineness or proclaiming to be God. And we know the Antichrist. That's one of the things that he's going to do in that abomination of desolation, that he's going to enter into the holy place, the holy of holies, actually. And he's going to proclaim himself to be God. So constantly we see these false representations, these, these lies, these, these presentations that someone else is God, when over and over and over we see verses like this, that only he is God. And really what it comes down to is right back to what the scripture that you shared from Genesis 3, and that is people, and this is the deceit of, of Satan, he does not want us to acknowledge the authority of God. Mm -hmm. So if we say, oh, there's many gods, then we get to choose the one that we like and not only choose the one we like, but also even make the one we like in order that we make decisions and we don't submit to his authority. So anytime there's an attack upon the one God, it's really based in a desire for people to choose their ways and make their laws and make their pathway in life rather than submitting to the instructions of God. The one God implies his authority, and that's what people don't want. Correct. Thank you for that. Now let's start uh, digging in a little bit further into the New Testament with um, looking at Yeshua, Jesus' exclusivity as the only way to the Father. Now, some of these scriptures that we'll be looking at, many people know them very well, but when we really look at them really closely, it just really highlights the exclusivity of Yeshua. So let's start with one of the most widely known scriptures around the planet, which is, of course, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and we've highlighted that text in red, only begotten son, because I've heard some teachings that people are saying that he wasn't the only begotten son of God, which is blasphemous. That whoever believes in him, it doesn't say about anyone else, should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, one thing that's re related to this scripture, and I think it's good to just kind of put as a foundation this, this fact, but Yeshua was crucified. If we look at his trial at the Sanhedrin, when the high priest began to question him, 
it all went to one thing. Is he God? Mm -hmm. And, and the charge against him of blasphemy was because they saw, and they were right, mm -hmm. that he proclaimed himself to be God, God incarnate, God among us. So it's so tragic today when, when people set aside and make such ridiculous statements that Yeshua never proclaimed himself to be God. He did. Mm -hmm. He's also here. We'll go to this scripture, the son of God. And as it says here, the only begotten son of God. And this has that term only begotten son speaks. If we understand the, the message here, it speaks of his divinity that he is divine. He is the one that is established. There was never a time he didn't exist. But when I say established, I'm not speaking about his existence. He always existed. He's eternal, not just looking forward, but looking past. An important theological truth. There never was a time that Yeshua did not exist. He's eternal. But when it speaks about his only begotten son, sonship, is related to servant. So he was established in this world. He was sent. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born for a purpose, and that is to establish this new covenant, which is based upon a kingdom hope and the motivation of God, as it says here, for God so loved the world. So this work of redemption has very broad, very broad implications, not just to an elect, as some as teach, but as this scripture says, and obviously in First John where it says that, that his death was not only for us, meaning believers, but for the entire world. So we see that, that God so loved the world that he gave. Love is related to giving, sacrifice. And the last part I think is the, the real key for us, that if one should believe in him, and the implication is only him. He's the only begotten son, so there's no one else that fits this role as the son of God, the servant of God, that brings about what this passage is, is speaking about, and that is that we should not perish because of his work. He was the only one that died on the cross. He's the only instrument of justification, redemption, salvation, and the outcome of that is everlasting life, and that's what God the Father sent his son into the world to do. And that is to make possible for us doing everything. So if we just, as it says here, believe in him, the outcome of that is that free gift of eternal life. Great. Thank you. And I think uh, when the scripture tells us so beautifully that for God so loved the world, like you said, it's about giving, offering, sacrifice. But, you know, we're going to look at later on, like I said, a short clip, how Satan is also using love to deceive so many and to move them away from the true gospel and from uh, basically that Yeshua is the only way. So please keep that in mind. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that a little bit later on. Acts 4.12, very important scripture, fundamental scripture that nor is there salvation any other. And once again, we've highlighted in red any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I mean, such a verse of clarity. To me, this is one of the, the verses that have such simple but profound implication for understanding that gospel message, understanding the work, the all-sufficient work of redemption that Messiah did. But a question that's going to always derive from that is the name. Now, oftentimes we use the term Yeshua, Mm -hmm. Simply because for, for many Jewish people, we understand that Yeshua means salvation. It also just gives us maybe a, a cultural connection to Yeshua, where the name Jesus, because of much distortion uh, based upon other cultures and such, kind of makes a disconnect for us. But I want to say something very, very clear and when we say no other name, when we say that, we're referring to the language that you're speaking in, whether it's Hebrew, Yeshua, whether it's Greek, Jesus, whether it's English, Jesus. And I travel or used to travel a lot, uh, not so much lately, but, but I hear the name Jesus in so many different languages. And what 
many people will come back at, and I hear this, and it's just unbelievable that they could make such a elementary mistake. And that is, they say, well, wait a second. You know, if you say Jesus and not Yeshua, the problem is the name Jesus is pagan because it's, it's from the Greek Jesus, mm -hmm. and we have that pagan god Zeus. Well, what they don't realize is Jesus, that last part, that last syllable is with a sigma, uh, an, an S, where Zeus is with a zeta. So there's absolutely no connection between the name Jesus with a sigma and Zeus with a zeta. So it just shows the, the because we hear things that sound similar, we make inferences and make statements that have no basis whatsoever. So I just want to be, be assured that whatever language you speak and how you refer to Jesus, whether it's Jesus in Spanish or Iesus in, in other languages as well, uh, it's that name. It's the person, and there's a key, the person of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, only through him. And that's why... And the word name is synonymous with character. And I say this, and I get in trouble for this. Uh, I get many times uh, some, some seminary professors having problem with this, but I will not back down. And that's this. If a person does not know Yeshua, Jesus, that he's divine, questions that, or that he's unique, they don't know the biblical Yeshua. Mm. And if you don't know the biblical Jesus, then you're not going to be saved because you have not believed in that name, that character, that identity. So it's very important that people, in order to be saved, have the basic, the foundational truth concerning the identity of, of Yeshua, that he is the only begotten son of God, that there is no other. So once you start saying there's other means to salvation, there's other saviors, there's other religions that, that represent truth, such a person does not know what's necessary to be saved because they are confused with the identity of Yeshua. We need to know that name, what that name represents, who it represents, if we're going to be saved. Great. Thank you for clarifying that, how true that is. Uh, linked, I guess, or aligned to Acts 4.12 is Romans, of course, which a lot of believers know very well. But once again, we wanted to touch on this as well because it makes reference to his name and his alone. So that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Highlighting that, of course, their salvation is found in no other name but Yeshua or Jesus' name. You know, I, you picked the scriptures, uh, Christian, and I, I'm so thankful that that. Many of the ones that, that you choose are, well, they're all relevant, but, but some just really hit the, the, the theological truth that we need to profess really puts it forth. And this is a great example of this because I hear so often, and I watch a lot of, of Christian television, listen to a lot of messages, read a lot of things that, that people are saying. And it's so frequent today for people to say, you know, you, you want to go to heaven when you die. You want God to help you with your life. You want this, want this, accept Jesus. And, and the problem is, that's all they say. Yes. It does not come with a, a confession of sin Repent. or a repentance of sin. Sometimes Repent. it does have forgiveness attached to it, but mm. not a repentant of sin. Maybe just an acknowledgement. Yeah, I, I need forgiveness and I'll trust him but a repentance, but this points out to something else. And, and this speaks of the requirement to believe in the resurrection. Mm. I mean, isn't it very clear that if you confess with your mouth that you're sure that he's Lord and you believe in your heart, you know, there's, there's pastors now that are teaching this, inviting Yeshua into your heart is pagan. It's not biblical. Here's a great example of this. Wow. When it says believe in your heart, it means to make a, a inward decision, a confession, to state as what you believe. So there's nothing wrong with this concept inviting Yeshua into your heart. 
a very biblical thing to do, no problem at all. But the end, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. If someone denies the resurrection, they are not saved. Correct. It is a requirement to believe, not just in the death, not just that I'm sinful, not just that he was crucified and such, but that he rose from the dead, the resurrection. And maybe sometime we can talk about the importance of just the, mm -hmm. the, the resurrection as a doctrine. But, but God raised him. This was God's stamp of approval, his acceptance on the work of Messiah. Now, Messiah had the power. The scripture says he laid his life down. No one took it from him. And he had the power to raise it up. He could have. But here's this, this submissiveness of the son. And that concept son relates to submissiveness. So it was God the father who raised him from the dead. And this is saying God approved of his work. And that's why we need to also believe in the resurrection. So he's the only way. And it's the resurrection that speaks of his conquering sin and death. So if we don't believe that he's the one, the only one that can conquer sin for us and, and conquer death in order that we have kingdom life, then we have not believed a biblical gospel. It's never my objective or desire to put doubt in people's mind, whether they have been saved or not. Sure. That's not my heart. That's not who, who I am and what I want to, to accomplish. But we need to know what the biblical gospel is, and it includes the death, burial, and so important, the resurrection. And this is such a, a important verse that, that states that. Correct. Thank you. And for some people that still despite him, then even reading these three scriptures that are so fundamental and critical, but let's look at another one as well in John 3, 36, that he who believes in the son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. I don't think you can get any clearer than that. Uh, you're, you're very, very right. We see the two possibilities, not multiple, but, but two. We are either going to see life, and, mm -hmm. and this word life is a kingdom word. Resurrection is a kingdom word. There's several that the word new is a kingdom word, but for this purpose, the word life He's talking about seeing a kingdom eternity. And if you don't have that kingdom eternity through him, and he's the only way, if you don't have that kingdom hope, then the alternative is what, what this verse concludes with, and that's the wrath of God. So there's either kingdom, life, or there's going to be wrath, the wrath of God, nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And what the scripture says, it requires not my good deeds, not what I do, but rather belief, faith in the son. And it's so important that we see the definite article, the son. Yes. Specifying that there's only one. The use of the definite article in Greek is so informing and so significant. So he who believes in the son has that everlasting, that word everlasting, eternal. Again, a kingdom word, the chief. According to the rabbis, looking at the Old Testament, I realize this is new, but, but this word olam, oftentimes translated wor world, but it can mean all of space and all of time. So the same word in Hebrew for world is also the world word for eternity. So everlasting life, kingdom life. And if you don't believe in him, if you don't believe in the son as the one and only son, then you won't see, you won't experience life. And you know what else? That word see is a word of perception or understanding. You won't understand the kingdom call, the kingdom character. And that's my concern. And I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent. But when you have a watered down gospel, yeah. you mentioned, and this is a term that I just came in contact with. My wife shared it with me uh, uh, maybe a week or two ago, the progressive church. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it sounds a great marketing term, progressive. Uh, people love that word in society, but the progressive church is really a confused church, a church that's progressing, moving forward to destruction because they are emptying the truth of the gospel 
and and lessening it, distorting it to that which is not not sufficient for salvation. Correct. Thank you. The next scripture we'll look at is once again in John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Beautiful scripture that encapsulates both the Father and the Son together. It, it is a great scripture. And, and here again, you, you, you don't need to, a theological degree or what. I, I love the fact that, that God makes it so simple that a, a small children can, a small child can read that and come away with biblical truth with the revelation of God. You want eternal life, kingdom life. You want forgiveness from your sins, but that you can experience that. And this word no is an experiential no, that you know all of this kingdom implications forever, but it only comes through the true God. And here again, the only true God, that definite article, the word the, setting aside him as the only divine one. And, and this word conjunction chi for and, it links in a very important way in this context, the only true God, and we could translate this word, even, even Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So when you understand that this Greek word chi is a conjunction, and it doesn't always just mean and, but it can be used emphatically, as in this case, with the word even, meaning we're speaking about the one true God, this is, this is what the word even means in this context, even Jesus Christ. So this is speaking very strong about the divinity of Christ. And, and this is so sad because, and again, a, a brief tangent, if someone says there's another way, and this is really the heart of what we're talking about. Sure. If someone says there's another way that is so insulting to, to Jesus personally, both God the Son and God the Father, because God the Father did the only thing that would bring about justification in humanity, that we could be saved and have that everlasting life. And if the work of the cross that, that Yeshua did if there's another savior if there's another name this means the the cross he didn't have to there was another way and and this is highly insulting because he did the supreme act the only act of salvation and people are saying you know you died in vain you didn't have to do that that was your choice but but there's other means so it's so insulting to our savior that did the one thing for us to be saved. And if we reject that, it's, it's a shameful thing. It's highly, highly insulting to the love of God. Correct. It's actually tragic, actually. So uh, we're going to spend a little bit of more time on the following scripture, which is in Matthew. And the reason for that, uh, right after that, we're going to show that short clip. Um, but sadly, there are so many people, not only that either deny that there's only one true God or deny that Yeshua, Jesus, is exclusively the only way. But they're even saying that, you know, there isn't really a narrow gate. It's, it's, it's wide. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I'll let Scripture speak for itself, but in Matthew 7, uh, verses 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Just before I hand over to you, Baruch, to uh, you know, really look at this and open up this scripture, because we need to spend quite a bit of time on it, that also highlights, and I'm stunned that some self-proclaimed pastors or Christians actually teach that, you know, it's not necessarily a narrow gate. That's not what he meant. And God's not cruel that if you, if you don't choose Yeshua that you're going to spend uh, eternity separated from him. But it is very clear, and it's very clear also how they start manipulating, distorting scripture, distorting the truth, and really perverting the scripture. So if we can spend a bit of time, you know, that would be really appreciated. Well, this scripture here again, not hard to understand. Great scripture that speaks out the revelation of God in regard to the uniqueness 
and how narrow. You know, the world today, society, and it's probably not just today, it's, it's, it's consistent throughout generations, but this broadness. Mm. And I, I remember there was a, a very famous pastor in, in California. He's recently passed away a few years ago. And he really was one who spoke about the broadness of mm. the love of God, the inclusiveness of God's love. And that God, and there was another, here again, I'm not going to mention names in this segment, but there's another very well-known evangelist that was speaking to him. <clears throat> and he said something that is heresy. And he said, you know, God, and this has to do with a, a perversion of the biblical doctrine of election. And he's saying, you know, God is calling people from all segments of life. Why? Well, I, I believe that. And he says, he's calling them into eternity. Mm. And he says, they might, and here's a quote, they might not even know the name Jesus or Yeshua or that term in their language that relates to Jesus Christ. And he was speaking about how it's the power of the call and it's the call that saves. I don't see that everywhere, at anywhere in the scripture. No. It says many are called, but few are chosen. And it's this, this unwillingness to let scripture form our beliefs. When we make our objective to be man pleasers, and this is really what this is coming down to. Yeah. And, and let me tell you that when you believe, you know, the topic that you chose, Christian, the, the exclusiveness of Yeshua as the only savior, this is even on seminary campuses today, more and more, and this is shameful, but more and more are embracing that, that Yeshua is just one of several different ways, that there's redemption and salvation in other religions, but this is not what the scripture says. And that's why, and what I would highlight with this is that it says that there are few who find it. Mm. We are becoming a smaller and smaller number today about those who believe that Yeshua, his name, is the only way into the kingdom of God. There's no other good news, no other gospel. This makes it so, so clear, narrow, exclusive. And the problem is this. We, we remove things from the Old Testament. Passover, you just couldn't choose any animal. You couldn't choose a dog or a lion or a, a, a cat to be, to be the Passover sacrifice. It had to be a sheep and not just any sheep or it could be a goat, but one of a certain age, one that met the criteria. And it's not coincidence. It's full of the sovereignty and the providence of God that Yeshua is called the lamb of God, that he was crucified on Passover in the same way it was only the blood of the Passover lamb, nothing else that brought the people out of Egypt in a redemptive relationship, only the blood of Yeshua, the blood of Jesus Christ, his blood alone, as Paul says, he's our Passover lamb. So when you understand Passover and the foundation for the context of understanding the gospel within a Passover context, it becomes very simple to reach the conclusion that the way is narrow and that the gate is, is narrow and it's Yeshua and no one else. Right. Thank you. Just before we look at the, the clip uh, that will go for a few minutes, once again, I, I touched on this in the last one, but I, I do advise a few discretion is advised. And I don't mean that in a funny way because it's for believers that, you know, uh, follow Yeshua, read the word and are led and, and, and guided by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it is very difficult to see these things, but we need to demonstrate it. Now, I just want to touch on a few points just before I, I show the clip that, uh, there are so many more clips, of course, but we don't want to dwell on that. What we want to dwell on is the word of God giving us clear instruction as to what to avoid. But um, there's, there's four points I want to touch on in these clips. that some of the self-proclaimed pastors and teachers being uh, elusive about confirming that Yeshua is the only way. So we're going to see a little bit of that. It's, and it's very disappointing, especially with the platforms that they're given. They should have the courage and the boldness to state the truth that Jesus, Yeshua, is exclusively the only way. Without 
you know, saying, I don't know, or maybe, or without that, you know, assertiveness. Um, we're going to see also in this clip as well, the people are claiming that we serve the same God as other gods, like we touched on as well, the same God of Islam, which to me is outright blasphemy. But um, point number three that we're going to look at is Satan uses so-called celebrities, self-proclaimed celebrities, who sadly do have a lot of influence in the world today, and they're claiming that there are many ways to heaven. Uh, and the last point is interfaith movement that we've touched on, which is extremely dangerous. And uh, we know that God doesn't share his, uh, his sacred altar with anyone. Uh, and he really negates, like I said before, the importance of the sacrifice of Jesus, Yeshua, and the shedding of his precious blood. And then we'll finish off looking at some other couple of scriptures as well. But I'll just um, move into this clip. So just please bear with me. Us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Peace in our families, peace across this land. And there I ask, O oh Lord, peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. Amen. And a woman. How do you view God in a desert? There's two types of birds. There's vultures and there's hummingbirds. One lives off dead carcasses, rotting meat. The other lives off the beautiful sweet nectar in a particular flower on a particular desert plant. In the same desert, they both find what they're looking for. Do you know, take it all the way back into the Old Testament and the Muslim and you, we actually serve the same God, Allah, to a Muslim, to us, our Father, God. And of course, through history, those views have changed greatly. Words can apply to you, no matter what your faith and background. We get so twisted in this country and in many cultures to create divides and boundaries and barriers between human beings because of because of our faith difference. Think about it, that we use the thing that we believe makes us closer to God, the very things divide us from one another at times. And that makes no sense. And so I, I'm not one of those people, there was a time you would see people in the pulpit say, oh, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. That's insanity in many ways, because that is not what, what, what Jesus even believed. And so the key is that you believe in God and whatever your path is to God, I celebrate that personally. I celebrate that. Again, we have enough in this world that divides us. We need to find those things that bring us closer together. And if God cannot bring us closer together, then something is wrong, not with God, but in how we think we know God and understand God. Amen. So come on, let's click. But we've just got one more question coming through. Boring Fireford says, what's your view of the current Pope? You know, the Pope has obviously been reaching out and has been a force of moderation in comparison to his predecessors. What do you I, make I of it? I think the Pope is fantastic. You know, I just think his tone, his humility, his, you know, I loved when he said the other day, you know, and it's, the, it's, it's our view too. We're not trying to, you know, make this a little bitty narrow thing. Anybody's welcome. We, we may not agree, you know, 100% on doctrine and theology, but you know what, we're, we're, the, the church... Catholic Church, our church, it's open for everybody. So I like his tongue, not pushing people away, but I believe God's big and his mercy is very wide. Do you believe that only Christians can be in relationship with God? No, I believe that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, in the way I read that, Jesus said he is the, he's the road marker, he's the map. So I think God loves people so much that whether they accept or reject him, he's still gracious and he's still moving and he's still giving you massive red blinking lights for mm -hmm. chances to take a, a right turn where maybe you would take a left but i believe god loves people and that's what this whole gospel is based on it's love you take the love out of it we've got a moral book okay so here's the big question are there many paths to get to the one god well i believe oprah that there i believe that jesus is the way to the one god but I believe there are many paths to Jesus. You know, you don't know how Jesus would reveal himself to somebody. So I'm not into excluding people. 
Jesus can reveal himself to anybody. Does that mean that all people, all races, obviously in your, your, your church, we see all people, all races. I can't imagine that you would have 16,000 people in there and none of them would be gay. So are gay people also included? Absolutely. Anybody is, you know, you know, Oprah, we sometimes make a, I say we, maybe the Christian community makes a bigger deal out of gay, out of being gay, but. Will a gay person be accepted into heaven? as you see it? Well, I believe they will, mm -hmm. because I believe that, um, you know, if we, you have to have forgiveness for your sins, but you know, sometimes we look at gay being, you know, a bigger sin than being proud or being, you know, not telling the truth. I don't think God categorizes sins. I think we're all changing and, you know, I'd love to think that we're all going to be without one sin. I hope that's true, but I don't think, I don't think any of us would make it to heaven. The world is accepting that there are many paths to God, and though we believe in God by different names and worship him in different ways, they say that we are still praying and worshiping the same God. It's a blasphemous lie, and I rebuke it in the name of Yahshua. I've played this in my other videos on this topic, but I will show this again here because it illustrates this point the best. This video is a global initiative developed by the Pope World Prayer Network. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Alá. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto. Buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todos. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Confío en vos para difundir mi petición de este mes, que el diálogo sincero entre hombres y mujeres de diversas religiones conlleve frutos de paz y justicia. Confío en tu oración. Representatives of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, Native American, Jewish, Islamic, and Christian communities of New York City. Now, I can tell you, Papa Francesco, we in New York are sinners. We are sinners. We have many flaws. We make many mistakes. But one of the things we do very well is sincere and fruitful interreligious friendship. We, who have the honor of pastoring our people, we work together. We pray together, we meet together, we talk to one another, and we try to serve as one. The city we are proud to call our earthly home while awaiting our true and eternal residence in heaven. May God protect us. May God nourish us. May we work together. May our dialogue be enlightening. May we be free from hate. Om, peace, peace, peace. Lead us from untruth to truth, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May all know peace. Homage to the Buddha. Victory begets enmity. The, de the defeated dwell in pain. The peaceful live happily. Let us pray in silence. In many ways, now, many paths to what you call God. That her path it. might be something else, and when she gets there, she might call it the light. But her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, to, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. I it could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? I can't see any one of these faiths as superior to any of the others. 
I see each of them has its own leading to the ultimate God. And each has its own insight and genius. And what we say about God isn't God at all. Uh, the, the biblical God we have is a kind of starter kit, really. I love that. Uh, the biblical God is a starter kit. Yes. I love that. Hey, I'm Steve Harvey, stand-up comedian, entertainer, television host, family man. But most importantly, I happen to be a man of faith. See, oftentimes, people who are religious think their religion is right and everybody else is wrong. There is only one way to God. But Steve's faith is unique because it's really not about that. There's no one, one way to heaven, no one way to paradise. It's like television. Now it's over 800 channels of cable, and they're all pretty entertaining. So I'm pretty sure, man, that to get to heaven, there's got to be more than one route. Because somebody watching another channel or taking another channel to you, they still get entertained, and they probably still get to heaven. What Steve did reminds me a lot of this mosque. This mosque in Abu Dhabi belongs to people in the Islamic faith. But as a sign of tolerance to the churches next to them, they renamed the mosque to Mary, Mother of Jesus Mosque. Can you imagine a mosque with the name Jesus on it? Yeah, the world could use a little bit more of that. And it's not just about Christians and Muslims. It's about Christians, Muslims, Jews, and everybody else. At a time when religious intolerance is on the rise, we need many, many more of these mosques, many, many more of people like Steve. After hanging out with Steve for a week and visiting mosques, churches, and museums in the Emirates, I am convinced religious harmony, religious respect, religious tolerance is the most important thing and we need to promote that every single day. Well, I mean, uh, disturbing to look at, um, but Baruch, your thoughts? It just shows that, that we are so far removed in so many places from scriptural truth that people want a religion that makes them feel good. And when we are ruled by our feelings, we're playing right into the battleground of Satan. When we say such things as, well, it seems to me, this makes sense to me. This is what I've been waiting for all my life to hear. All those things are rooted in the thoughts of man. And as the scripture says that, that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. And therefore, we need to set our thoughts, our ways aside. What I frequently say is nail them to the cross and embrace the truth of God, his revelation. And unfortunately, those, those clippets all, all showed a, a church and leaders within the church that are spiritually sick. There's no other way to put it. They are, are sick spiritually. They do not know the, the healing message of Messiah. They totally distort and have missed out on the simple message that is Yeshua that saves. There is no other. Correct. And, and folks, I know, sadly, uh, believers that actually look up to some of these people like self-proclaimed Christians like uh, Oprah Winfrey and Steve Harvey, I think his name is. And folks, that's just demonic statements that they make. It is done be fooled. Don't be deceived. That's what it is. Um, you know, they negate the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of Yeshua on the cross. And we're seeing a rise in that in these last days. We're seeing such an increase in that, that uh, we've discussed this before, Baruch. We mentioned that there's a convergence that's happening as we enter into the last days, that we see an increase. Of course, there's always been uh, bad people in the world. There's always been uh, unethical people, immoral people. But now... You know, like the scripture says, they call what's good bad and what's bad is good. It's just such a convergence and such a high level of deception that it's truly alarming. So people, I urge you, just don't be deceived. 
Uh, let's once again, like we touched on before, scripture is very clear about Yeshua being the only way. And let's proclaim it. We have a voice. We have a voice, whether it be in our workplace, whether it be with our neighbors, whether it be in platforms such as this. You know, let's be bold about it because let's confess Yeshua before men. You know, uh, it's all scriptural. And I'd like to just focus on two key scriptures brought before we uh, we end this. That First uh, Timothy 2 uh, verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, which once again capitulates the father and the son relationship being exclusive. Just over for your comments. Well, it speaks about Yeshua's humanity and why he became man. Biblically, we know that he's fully God. He never ceased to be God. He is eternally the divine son of God. But he became a man so that he could be that mediator, the only means for which men could find salvation, men and women be saved. Just wanted to say one thing about what we're, we're going, where we're going to. And I appreciate your statement so much about being bold, about being out there in the workplace and such. But, but realize this, and I'm, I'm no prophet, but I can see the, the handwriting on the walls. And what we're talking about right now, it is going to be viewed as bigotry. Mm. It is going to be viewed as hate speech. Yeah. And when we speak about the, the exclusiveness of Yeshua as the only savior. This is in a few short years, maybe a decade, it is going to remove, we have the freedom right now to, to share this and put it online, but it's going to be marked. It's going to be seen as hate speech. It's going to be removed in the years to come. And anyone that has such a belief that, that you and I have, Christian, a, a belief that's rooted in not our desires or our thoughts, but what the word of God has taught us. When, when we have such a belief, we are going to be seen as, as enemies and be set aside and won't have the privilege of sharing things on platforms such as this. Correct. And look at folks as well, and you're spot on, bro, because that's that's what uh, Satan will use, that we're bigots, and it's all about hate speech and, and all this kind of nonsense. But, you know, I am well aware Jesus, Yeshua, loves the homosexual. He just hates the sin, you know. That's and not, and not only kept, I'm not only highlighting homosexuality, but he will open his arms and, and embrace anyone that confesses him as Lord and Savior and has that repentance. But... He will not ever tolerate and accept sin. Sorry, I interrupted you there, Baruch. No, not, not at all. I, I, I concur uh, 100% with you on that clip um, when I think it was Joel Olstein that was speaking. What, what he failed to say, yes, we're all sinners. And, and sin is sin. Now, certain sins are called abominations, but regardless, it's the same blood of Yeshua that, that forgives sin, all sin. But, but here's the problem. We all struggle with sin, mm -hmm. but I need to confess it as sin. Can a homosexual find their way into the kingdom of God? Yes. Mm -hmm. In the same way, an adulterer can find his way, her way into the kingdom of God. But it begins with saying adultery sin. It is unacceptable to God. That is why Yeshua died upon the cross. It's his blood that, that provides the forgiveness from sins like adultery and homosexuality and all sin. But it's when someone condones homosexuality or anything as okay, that's, that God's all right with, any sin that we say it's okay, it is extremely problematic and it is someone who has not understood repentance. So yes, a homosexual can say, I struggle with this. I, I need to be set free of this. And I'm trusting in Christ to be the one who forgives me and sets me free. I realize he's calling me out of this. That person can be saved. That person can experience God's love. Absolutely. But if a person says, in regard to whatever sin it might be, I have no intention of leaving. This is acceptable. I'll accept Yeshua, but I'm not leaving this. I don't see this as sin. That person 
will not be in the kingdom of God. This is the distinction that, that needs to be understood. Correct. Well said, Baruch. And even us, whether it be when we're sharing on these platforms, like we've touched on before with neighbors or friends or work, you know, we, we also need to keep short accounts with the Lord. You know, we're not perfect. You know, every day I need to, you know, come before the Lord and I say, Lord, forgive me for this, you know, and repent. So by no means, uh, you know, because some people say, oh, but you're all hypocrites. No, we're not. You know, we, we, we battle through things every day and the Lord shows us things that we need to improve in our lives every day. And when we do it, you touched this on, uh, I think, our last video. He show us something, we'll work on it, but then he'll show us something else. So it's, it's a process and it's a walk with the Lord that we all have. But um, yeah, it's, it's just tragic what is happening in the world with the increase of, you know, the interfaith movement because they, they really, and I, if you notice that clip, it's all about love love and that's why i mentioned that you know they'll use you know certain words that are in scripture but just to lead you away from the exclusivity of yeshua which is you know very very sad i want to also finish up uh, baruch with uh, of course john 14 6 which i think i wanted to lead to the last scripture because this just you cannot get any more clear than this scripture when jesus yeshua himself said I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Over to you, Brooke. So clear. It's, it's good that it's exclusive because there is one solution. You know, I, I've never heard people get upset when the doctor says, here's the medicine, and it's this medicine, and don't take something else, but it's this that's going to bring healing physically to you. No one says, no, I like to choose the medicine that, that sits well with me, that's, that's acceptable in my mind. And people understand that there's a solution. And if there's one solution, all the others are not. Mm -hmm. And this is what he's saying, that he's the, the truth. He's the only way. And it's only when we embrace his truth and him as a way are we going to experience what is truly exclusive. And that is a kingdom life. There's no other kingdom. There's only one. It's the kingdom of the God of Israel. It's the kingdom of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Yeshua. And if we do not name his name, acknowledge his work as the only means of salvation, then that person, and it grieves us. This is why we do the things that we do is because we don't want anyone to perish. We want to see all people be brought to salvation through that very narrow, that very specific, that very well-defined message of the gospel. Any other way is a way of deceit and lies, and it's from, as you pointed out, from the pit of hell. We need to proclaim that and not shy away from that, that statement. Correct. Thank you. And, and folks, for everyone watching, I ask for, I always just ask if you can ask the Lord for discernment as well, even in practical situations. What you've noticed, you'll probably notice is that you may be at a work function or a, just a social function and people around you, they, they may talk about Buddha and Allah and Muhammad and Joseph Smith and all these kind of things. But as soon as you mention Yeshua, I mean, something happens to people, you know, that anti-cross spirit just rises up within them and be aware of those things. Be aware there's also, there's, and we can probably talk about this in another discussion, but there are also heresies that are quite deceptive, like, uh, you know, the Mormon church or Freemasonry, which is extremely dangerous. Um, some of the things that are taught in the, free, in the lodges are just purely satanic. So I just encourage you, anyone, brothers and sisters, if you're involved in any of them like Freemasonry or the Mormon church, please, you know, you can even write to us. We'll, we'll, we'll actually, at the end of this uh, discussion, like we always do, we put a, an email address where you can email us comments and questions, but also if you need more information on this, we're happy to provide it because we're living in some very, very dangerous times in terms of deception. But this is an opportunity, like I think you've touched on many times as well, Brooke, that this is an opportunity for us as believers to rise and to be bold and to say, yes, I stand for the Lord. Yeshua is the only way. If he is for me, who can be against me? And we will not be moved. So, in saying that, Baruch, I'll just hand over to you for some closing comments. 
Well, I just appreciate you and the opportunity to, to do these conversations, these discussions. I think the, the subjects are so important and this one foundational. If we forget that he's the only way, then we don't know that way. We don't have that hope and we will not have a kingdom experience. And again, this is what we're about, sharing truth so that people can know the truth, the way and experience that eternal life. That's our hope. Amen. So folks, thank you once again for joining us for this discussion. We hope and we pray that you've been blessed. And please write to us. Like I said, at the end of this program, you'll have an email address where you can write us to. We're encouraged by your views and by your comments as well and by your feedback. And once again, Baruch, thank you so much for your time, for uh, sharing you, your views on such important scriptures that uh, we really need to focus on in these incredibly challenging days that we're living in. So thank you for your time again, Brooke. Thank you, Christian. Until next time. Until next time, everyone. Shalom, blessings, and hopefully we'll see you soon.